Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 3.30 event at the IAEA Pavilion. This is a production of Nuclear for Climate, an association of 150 organizations who have come together to discuss nuclear as clean energy at COP27 here in Sharm el-Sheikh. I am delighted to produce a fascinating panel for you today. We're going to be talking along the following theme, powerful nuclear stories, people and their reactors. Now, we have a diverse panel in that not everybody here has a real reactor yet. Some people even had reactors and now they're gone. So we're going to hear a wide variety of experiences that touch on what we uh, have to do with nuclear reactors and the way nuclear programs touch our countries. This is Solutions Day here at COP, so I hope that the negotiations have wrapped up and completed all the solutions we need to save the climate. But just in case, we've got a number of stories that should help everybody arrive at even better solutions next year. My name is Mark Nelson. I'm the Managing Director of Radiant Energy Group, a energy consultancy based in Chicago, Illinois. I'm here with American Nuclear Society, and I am proud to introduce our panel, starting from right next to me, uh, Hiba Asomnu, who is a PhD candidate in nuclear science and working with the Egyptian Atomic Energy Agency. We have Alfred Mbayo, who is a working engineer and businessman from Sierra Leone. And we have Amanda Mbele, who is an, a nuclear scientist who's a project lead for waste and decommissioning at NEPS, uh, the nuclear energy company of South Africa, NEXA. Next up, we have Seth Gray of Washington, D.C. in the United States. He is here also with American Nuclear Society and is the CEO of Lightbridge Corporation. Now we have Abu Bakr Sadiq Ali, and he is here from Nigeria. He is a PhD candidate in nuclear uh, science. And then finally, we have Ia Anstut, who is a high school student from Sweden. And she is here, uh, many of the people here are with International Youth Nuclear Congress, and Ia is here with Generation Atomic. Now, we intentionally have up here people who have grown, grown up in wildly different circumstances, just in terms of numbers. We have people who have grown up on 10,000 kilowatt hours per year of household electricity. And we have people here who have grown up on zero kilowatt hours per year of household electricity. We have people here who are from some of the most advanced and wealthy societies that history has ever seen. We have people here who spent many of their young years in nations at the bottom of the human development index. Here's what I think we're going to do. I would love to have each of you introduce yourselves in your own words with a little personal story, and I'm going to give you the theme. What was the first moment that you realized nuclear energy had something to mean to you in your lives, either for your career, for your studies, or for your family? So we're going to start at the end with Ia. And I think you have a very interesting biographical note you should share with us as you tell us this story. Here we go. So uh, the first time I came in contact with nuclear power was by being bored. Uh, I live in Sweden and over 40% of our electricity is from nuclear power. And um, I was born extremely prematurely and the only reason I survived my birth was because of the electricity generation in Sweden. Had I been born anywhere else, I would have died. And that is my first contact with electricity and therefore with nuclear power. But it, I didn't know it was nuclear power then, and it took me many years until I did. But when I was uh, 14, I got active in Fridays for Future, which is the Thunberg's movement. And um, no one had any solutions. And I felt like the world desperately needed them, and my future desperately needed them. So I got involved, I started looking stuff up, I started calculating the numbers, and I found nuclear power. And that seemed to work for my country. So I thought that should work for other countries. And well, here I am. Fantastic. Uh, so what you're saying is, had you been born in some of the nations represented up here today, you would not be here? 
my chance of survival in Swe at Sweden's foremost uh, neonatal facility was around 70%. Had I been born anywhere else in the world, it would have been marginally under 50. Had I been born in the global south, it would have been around 20. Wow. Uh, please, Abu Bakr, you're up next. Tell us a little bit about your life in energy and how you discovered nuclear. Mine was uh, actually out of curiosity. I usually say it this way. Uh, way back in my secondary school days, uh, around 2009-2010, we were thought uh, sources of energy. And uh, I realized the teacher explained uh, some of the sources of energy. But when it comes to nuclear, he just mentioned it to us. And uh, he passed. So out of my own uh, curiosity, like I said, I went on to look for more information on what nuclear energy is. And then I realized uh, with nuclear energy, uh, we are bound to solve most of the energy challenges we have in Africa. So that was the starting point. And uh, I wanted to venture into uh, the, the, the sector. But then I realized in Africa or in Nigeria specifically, you can't even uh, study such courses. So uh, after a lot of researches, I was told I have to have a background in physics. That's my undergraduate. And then uh, I can do that in my postgraduate studies. Uh, at that time, it was a tough decision for me because I had to drop uh, a dream of almost 10 years. I was dreaming to become a petrochemical engineer. Another challenge was uh, my parents and uh, other relatives, including my teachers. They, was like, they were like, what's this guy thinking about? Like, we are not even close to uh, that technology here in Nigeria. So why is he going to venture into it? It was like a waste of time. Going to study physics and then going back to start a postgraduate studies in, in nuclear physics. But I was able to pull through. I, I finished physics and then I was uh, awarded an admission to study nuclear physics. I finished nuclear physics and now I'm a PhD candidate in nuclear physics, reactor physics to be specific. One will wonder, how will somebody in Nigeria be studying reactor physics? Well, we do it uh, theoretically, and to a larger extent, we have a research reactor where we learn some of these things in, and uh, with connections of our friends in other parts of the, uh, the world, we learn to uh, uh, get some information of some of these uh, 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 reactors. Uh, and Today, I can say I'm happy, I'm doing what I'm doing, and nobody is uh, forcing me to do uh, otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Abu Bakr. Seth, America in many ways was the great nuclear builder. And I have to say, you are CEO of a nuclear energy company in a time where maybe we're optimistic now, but there were some very dark times where the future was not in nuclear. How did you end up in this field? Well, I'll also talk about academics. Um, I was in law school near the end of the Soviet Union and taking a class called Soviet Law when the professor said that we had to either take a final exam or write a paper. But I didn't want to take the final exam and actually learn all that stuff, so I figured I'd write a paper. And the topic I proposed was representing a refusenik or dissident in the Soviet Union who was denied an exit visa. And I went to the State Department and some NGOs and was given the name uh, Gregory Gimpelson, who was a uh, nuclear engineer. And he had worked on um, submarine and missile technology. And I ended up representing him as an academic exercise, but then actually took on representing him. And with the help of a major law firm, he, he actually got out. And um, I started to interact more and more with the nuclear community through him. And then as I became a lawyer, I was working in high technology transfer internationally of technologies, export controls, including nuclear. I started visiting nuclear power plants and getting very impressed with the people, the safety culture, just the cleanliness of the place, how well run they were, and really got very attracted to the whole culture around nuclear power 
including just how safe it was and all the redundancy and just how capable the people were, including in multiple roles, the reactor operators who were also firefighters and just such remarkable people. Thanks, Seth. Amanda, you come from a country with one nuclear plant. How did you find nuclear power? Uh, okay, well, like everyone else, I also gonna, I'm also going to start uh, with academics. So I studied geological sciences, majoring in environmental and engineering geology. Uh, during my studies, they would use radioisotopes to calculate the date, basically dating water, groundwater systems. Uh, but then I didn't even pick, I did not even pin it to nuclear energy as such. It was just radioisotopes being used. And then I went to a conference uh, where I met my then boss, they had these yellow drums uh, of nuclear waste. And I wanted to know more about this nuclear waste because now they're going to put them in my geological uh, sites and stuff. So I asked them, like, okay, what is happening with the nuclear waste? How is it managed, in fact? And then they started asking me back, like, okay, you have geology. So, in fact, we need you to join our team because we have the least addressed uh, topic in our organization. So they took me in as a science communicator to get deep into the geology, geological disposal sites as well as the nuclear waste. So that was my main topic, that was my main task at Nexa to make sure that the communications part addresses the nuclear waste uh, controversial topics all the time. And after having taught myself about nuclear, I had to start from scratch now, okay, not scratch as such, but learn more about nuclear science as in its uh, actual sense. And then I started teaching myself, teaching myself, and I was interested in the topic because I realized that it saves lives. I realized that, uh, especially South Africa, being a water scarce country, uh, you can desalinate uh, using nuclear energy and so forth. So I was like, I'm interested in this topic, and I started pursuing my master's in nuclear science, in nuclear engineering, basically. And that's how I got in love with nuclear. Yes. Fantastic. Alfred? Uh, Unlike Nigeria, which does have a large, world-famous energy industry, but no nuclear, Sierra Leone does not yet have much energy industry at all. How did you find nuclear energy? Um, the industry is just one. We do not even have nuclear specialization courses in the tertiary institutions. So, for example, if you are interested in studying nuclear energy engineering, you probably have to go out of Sierra Leone to study it. So, growing up in Sierra Leone, of course, I grew up in the rural communities. If you consider Sierra Leone, we have less than 26% of national electrification. And that is even worse in the rural communities where I grew up. So I only had the opportunity to have electricity at home when I was in high school. That is like I was about more than 18 years old. So when I started pursuing my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering, I started expressing interest in energy because I realized energy poverty was the biggest problem in Sierra Leone. So towards the end of my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, I was really, really interested in, in, in energy, sustainable energy. But then I considered the options, um, seeing the carbon footprint that the energy sector is creating around the world, global, uh, global warming, climate change, and so on. So I started seeing nuclear to be a better option, especially when I got exposed to the Africa, young generation in nuclear, because my knowledge in nuclear was really small, even though I had some basic knowledge in physics, nuclear physics in high school, but my knowledge in nuclear as a whole was really, really small. So when I got the exposure to organizations like that, they had seminars and so on, so I started understanding that, oh, nuclear could really be helpful. It is not only helpful in terms of the, the, the energy it will produce, dense energy it will produce, but also in terms of the cleanness of the energy it will produce. So at the end of the day, I just decided that nuclear energy could be an option. So, I mean, could be a priority I could take for my career. Thank you for that. So right before we get to you, Heba, I find it interesting that some people on this panel found nuclear because they were at nuclear plants, visiting nuclear plants, had lives powered by nuclear plants, had lives saved by nuclear plants. And then other people had energy ambitions. They had energy, but not the energy that they felt they could have in the case of Nigeria. And then finally, Alfred, you say you grew up in rural Sierra Leone. We'll probably have to come back to this experience. Uh, well, okay, could you just tell us something? What did it feel like to grow up in Sierra Leone in, in the 90s? To be very honest with you, in the early 90s in Sierra Leone, we had civil war. 
And that war actually left most of our infrastructure destroyed, of course, including the energy infrastructure. But in addition to that, the energy poverty was the center part of it. The entire situation in the country was kind of dark. So in the rural communities, you would expect worse situations because if the national electrification rate is somewhere around 26%, then that could be worse in rural communities because we do not have that decentralized energy system in Sierra Leone. Everything seems to be concentrated in the cities. So growing up in the rural communities, I had to, for example, study on candles at night or maybe on kerosene lamps. And that is quite risky because if you fall asleep, then it will just peel off and then there is fire. So that was a very horrible experience. Of course, I had that more than twice or three times. Maybe you burn your hands while you were studying. So it was a tough experience growing up in Sierra Leone, especially in the 90s at my age. And I believe, in fact, that is my source of motivation to see that young Sierra Leoneans that may come after me would have access to electricity that would enrich their life and, and unleash their potentials. Because I strongly believe that access to clean, reliable, and always available source of electricity could unleash the potentials of youth. Of course, in terms of academia, because you can study well and you can do your research on your laptop. If you have internet connection, all of these things are only possible when you have electricity. If you don't have electricity, then you just forget about these things. And unfortunately, you would hear some of our government officials talking about digitalization, for example. Talk, how can you talk about digitalization when you've not solved the problem of energy? So these things are quite interesting to me, and I really look deep into them, and I wish and hope that I'll be able to continue in this path so that when I go back home, I really make a difference. Thank you, Alfred. Now, we're home for you, Heba. This is Egypt. Uh, it's been a magnificent experience for me to come here for my first trip. I was sad I couldn't go to Cairo, and I have a great interest in Egyptian history. Can't, I don't have any time to see it, and I thought that Sharm El Sheikh would be so busy I wouldn't be able to appreciate it. But it's not been the case. The hospitality and the, the interest that young Egyptians I've seen have in the topic that we're addressing today has been outstanding. So could you tell us, how did you find nuclear science and technology? First, let's to start to talk about um, um, my uh, beginning at the nuclear uh, by studying uh, radiation biology in uh, pre-master. Um, then, uh, when I was studying this course, I found that uh, a lot of us doesn't know a lot of information about yielding of radiation. Uh, then I decided to make my master in uh, the nuclear field. So I go to the Egyptian Atomic Energy Authority and started to make my master there and started to use the uh, low-dose ionizing radiation. All of us uh, be afraid of using ionizing radiation, but when I started to use it and make experiment on rats, I found that low-dose ionizing radiation doesn't affect at all on any biological system of the body. So I decided to make my PhD also, but uh, to change the career, to move to the environmental sample where people live. As we, uh, we live in environment containing water, soil, plants, so I started to screening a lot of environmental uh, samples from different uh, regions where people live and uh, to, to measure the activity of uh, uranium, polonium, rhodium in, uh, in the different sample to tell people that uh, nuclear is not, uh, uh, is not uh, dangerous as they think. Uh, we already live in this. We already uh, live in environment that contain radiation. We already exist in this uh, environment. Uh, and then uh, Egypt uh, now has uh, four nuclear power planets. Uh, the first uh, one has been uh, created uh, since a few months, and the second one are going to be created 19 November of this year, and the third one and the fourth one. So we must uh, know knowledge about uh, nuclear energy in our life. I love that you studied low-dose ionizing radiation. Um, I know a number of people who have uh, studied it, and they find interesting things. Now, it is a fact that we've seen from surveys that around the world, women are more skeptical and more suspicious of nuclear energy, and it seems to be often about ionizing radiation, or radiation is the way people know it. Can you tell us two things? One, what did you find in your studies? And two, how have your conversations gone with women in your life who you thought should know about ionizing radiation? Okay. Um, 
I use in my study low dose ionizing radiation. Low dose ionizing radiation is using a radiation less than uh, one uh, uh, gray. Okay, I subjected my uh, my rats to uh, this ionizing radiation of different uh, type: uh, 0.25 gray, 0.75 gray, one gray. And I started to um, um, leave them to leave for 10 days and leave them to leave for one day. And after one day, I discarded them and they collect samples from them. I found uh, some biological uh, uh, system have been disturbed. But after discarding them after 10 days, I found all things returned back as it is. Uh, so using low dose ionizing radiation doesn't affect in any biological system in our body. Okay, conversation with women. I encourage some uh, women to come and make some researches on uh, radiation. Um, all of us, um, um, when I start my, radi my study, all of uh, friends told me not to, to go to Egyptian Atomic Energy uh, Authority. You will be affected. You will, uh, some hormones will be disturbance. Uh, some, you will uh, face a lot of problems. You can't be, get married. I told them, no, I, this is my aim and this is my goal and I, can, I, sh I should complete it. But uh, they, when they found me take the master and when they found me to the position that I has reached now, they become proud of that and they encourage me also. I love that story. Um, if you guys could pass the microphone down to Ia. So we just heard from Alfred that studying, attempting to study by kerosene lamp could lead to fires that could burn down a home or even injure or kill you. So. I've heard that Sweden has had some issues with nuclear power lately, and I'd love it if you could put into context um, how much energy Sweden has turned off. So, in just the last 10 years, uh, Sweden has turned off nuclear power plants equal to around 20 times the entire electricity consumption of Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone has a population of 8 million, and Sweden has a population of around 10 million. It's not that large a difference, but we have still managed to turn off uh, nearly 20 times the amount of energy that Sierra Leone has ever had. Um, okay, so why were those plants turned off? Were they too old? Largely, it was political. Um, the state reactors were turned off because it was political, and the political unrest turned off uh, a lot of the rest of them for partially economic reasons, but also just that it wasn't stable enough in the political spectrum. Thank you very much. If you could pass to Seth. So Seth, you live in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is a city powered by two local nuclear reactors. Uh, what have been your observations of the attitude towards nuclear energy among your friends and peers? You know, it's interesting that in the United States, people who live near nuclear power plants tend to be very pro-nuclear. And in Washington, D.C. itself, a lot of people don't know that their power is largely coming from the Calvert Cliffs plants in Maryland, um, which are you know, very much liked by the local communities in Maryland, and to some extent by the um, nuclear reactors at North Anna in Virginia and not too far away at Peach Bottom even in Pennsylvania. And um, Washington DC tends to be a community of people who are more favorable, I think, to nuclear power than a lot of others, um, partly because it's so entrenched in policy in Washington and people learning about energy security and climate reasons, um, but it's more out in the local areas uh, that people support nuclear, where the plants are, and it's sort of nuclear's curse that because of energy density, there are so few plants that have such a small footprint uh, that most people don't know their energy is coming from it. You know, I go to California and I ask people, what percentage of your energy comes from wind and solar, and what percentage comes from nuclear, and they tend to get it right, but backwards, because they see so much wind and solar and they don't really see the nuclear power plants. Um, so I think if we could have more school trips, more visibility, more visits to nuclear plants, that would help. Thank you very much. Speaking of visibility of electricity generation, 
Abu Bakr, could you tell something about what electricity generation sounds like in Nigeria? Well, in Nigeria, uh, the electrification rate is about uh, 60%. And uh, for over five years, it has been dangling between uh, 54, 55, 56. Luckily enough, last year, it was uh, uh, 60%. And then when you break it down, uh, the urban areas uh, have like 86% uh, 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 electricity access, while the rural area are down to uh, 32 or 34%, uh, which is very, very low. Now, the sources. The sources of uh, electricity or power generation in Nigeria, basically around 81.5 or 6% comes from fossil fuels. And then you have... Uh, you have uh, around 14% or so, uh, 14, 14 to 18% coming from hydro, and then you have less than 1% coming from renewables, both solar and wind combined. Now, uh, like I mentioned, 60% electrification rate. Now, where will uh, the rest of the percentage get their energy from? They have no choice than to uh, venture into uh, diesel generators. At least that's the option uh, they have. And then this ge uh, these uh, diesel generators, according to the World Health Organization, like 40% of the uh, households in Nigeria use these diesel uh, generators. And uh, about 70% of companies and firms use uh, diesel generators to power uh, their businesses and uh, activities. So, now this is uh, a synopsis of uh, the power generation. Of course, uh, I have looked into a power generation of so many countries, but I have never seen a complicated one like the Nigerians. For example, how can uh, a diesel generators generate about 70% of what companies and firms use? Uh, forget about the cost, which is very, very costly. There's the environmental impact, uh, which after the environmental impact, there's also the health impact, releasing uh, a lot of carbon into the air, and uh, most at times close to where people stay. So, and uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, propose, uh, proposals of how to checkmate this, but then things get out of hand. First of all, they said, let's increase the taxes on generators. They increase the taxes, but the importation keeps coming. Because uh, it's more or less, uh, uh, there's a syndicate uh, benefiting from such kind of uh, businesses. That's the diesel generator businesses. And, and uh, one and only way to solve this issue is to improve on the public energy system. The moment you Im improve on the public energy system, you don't have to uh, either increase tax or ask them to stop importing them they will definitely have to stop importing them. Why? Because the demand has been uh, cancelled. But as it stands, the demand is still there. And uh, this will to solve the uh, public uh, energy system uh, is, is, is at its lowest end. Uh, because uh, uh, the government keep, keep in, uh, investing in uh, solar uh, systems and the wind. Uh, the last time I checked, in 2019, uh, we invested around uh, 1.2 billion uh, US dollars in wind, uh, in solar. And then in 2020, uh, remember that 1.2 comes mostly from loans. And then in 2022, uh, around uh, 1.5, again, was inve invested in uh, 1.5 billion US dollars was invested in solar. Now, what the government are trying to do is uh, they, they, they are like trying to invest in solar so, that solar so that solar can take care of the rural areas. But now with all the investments, first of all, solar is not able to produce up to 1% of the, uh, of the electricity generation in the country. And then secondly, it has not taken care of like even half of the rural areas where most of those solar system has been concentrated. But again, they keep uh, investing in solar system. So, uh, luckily enough, uh, uh, these days, increase in nuclear uh, power has increased. 
And uh, we've seen how the government has shown interest and uh, uh, we believe we have been suggesting to them that this is the best way to tackle it. Thank you very much, Abu Bakr. So a land of decentralized generation has been achieved. We hear decentralized a lot here at this conference when people talk about solutions, but I almost never hear uh, decentralized from people who live with decentralized energy. It sounds like something to be overcome for those living with decentralized. Um, but let's go to a little bit of central energy. For Amanda, you're one of the people I've met who's lucky enough to have worked at a nuclear plant, and you were describing me to me earlier what the physical environment is, like what it looks like around uh, Kuburg nuclear plant in South Africa. Could you tell us a bit about that? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, I'm currently working at a research reactor, but uh, it's similar to similar environment as with the nuclear power plant in Cape Town, uh, of which we are fortunate enough because it is the first power plant in, in Africa uh, that we have run successfully for a number of years, more than 30 years now. And the environment that you're asking about, it's a pretty environment, I'll tell you. Uh, for instance, both these facilities, the research reactor as well as the nuclear power plant, we have animals running around because it's so safe to be around a nuclear power plant. So we have zebras, we have your giraffes, we have your antelopes, we have, it's a beautiful thing to, it's a beautiful environment to be around. So whilst you're at work, you're also getting to see the big five of Africa at the same time. And, and meaning that also the environment, the plants that are there, they're just beautiful. Uh, it's amazing fauna available around the nuclear facilities in South Africa. It's, it's, it's really relaxing, it's therapeutic working in nuclear facilities in South Africa, honestly. Uh, that is kind of astounding. I know that I've talked to people in the United States who say that uh, their nuclear plant has rare species. In fact, there's a nuclear plant in Florida where a, a family of manatees live near the nuclear plant and might even perish if the nuclear plant is turned off for too long. So I think that goes against what almost everybody thinks about a nuclear plant, which is even if it's necessary for power or even if you are not scared of it, that you have to keep nature away from it. But you've just described a vision that's extraordinary. And I know I will try to visit after that. Um, I won't call it safari. It will be a technical trip to see the nuclear plant, I'm sure. And we'll just have to take a very long lunch break. So uh, Heba, that brings me to you. The project you described is extraordinary. Four reactors built by 2030. Uh, that will make it, I think, the largest power plant in Africa, only comparable to maybe a few of the very largest dams on the entire continent. Um, but when I talk to young Egyptians here, I'm not sure they know much about the nuclear plant project. If you could be in charge of telling Egyptians about their nuclear plants. Let's start with just young Egyptians in school. Could you tell us a little bit about how that you would describe the project to them and how you would make them feel like the nuclear plant is part of their future? Um, the nuclear power plant in Egypt is, go is um, uh, since uh, uh, 1960, we didn't have built any nuclear power plant. We, uh, we're still using the last uh, two nuclear power plants that I've used for research. Uh, now uh, we started the first uh, nuclear power plant built uh, in uh, since two months. Uh, it is going to give about 1,200 uh, uh, megawatt. Um, and also um, the second one is going to be built uh, 19 November of this uh, year. And by 2026, uh, the first uh, nuclear power plant start to generate e electricity. And by 2030, the four nuclear power plants start to generate the electricity to most of Egypt. Uh, as we see in Egypt, we use about 21,000, nearly about 21,000 megabytes per hour. As the electricity is very important in, uh, in Egypt, uh, we, everything we use in our life uses electricity, charging mobile phone, charging laptop, uh, washing machine, um, electric dishes. Uh, so, uh, uh, we go to the nuclear energy to have um, an, an, a clean, uh, cheap energy. Uh, first, uh, the nuclear power energy, we t uh, take a lot of money. It um, takes about uh, 21 billion dollars uh, to build it. But uh, then we will have uh, a cheap and a clean uh, energy. And you will see that we are not have, going to have uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, there is no emission to it. 
and uh, also uh, using a nuclear uh, energy will encourage um, them uh, to go to the field of uh, nuclear uh, and to have a lot of scientists in this uh, field. You must be interesting in having uh, four nuclear power reactors in Egypt. You must be uh, proud of this. You must be proud of uh, making a lot of research on this, not only for uh, taking uh, a degree in uh, your uh, university, no, but uh, to be proud of uh, having this field and to study uh, in it. This is uh, when I go to the first visit to Egyptian Atomic Energy Authority. First thing I found that already we use radiation. Already we use radiation to preserve our uh, food, uh, to preserve our uh, uh, using uh, gloves. Doc, all of us use the gloves in home, uh, in hospital. Uh, we preserve the, we, we protect and preserve this by uh, exposing them to ionizing radiation. Uh, so uh, I'm not, I really, really, I want to encourage you to make a visit to it. Uh, it needs uh, some political uh, regulation to go to visit Egyptian Atomic Energy Authority, but you can follow up. Uh, you can go to their website. You can uh, make uh, take some training inside it. Uh, every three months, there is a training in uh, Egyptian Atomic Energy Authority, and also for the student in uh, the university, they have uh, a training for this. And you can go to see the nuclear reactor power found in Anshas. Uh, you can make a visit to it. Uh, you will find a new wallet. You will be proud of yourself. You will be proud that Egypt is having now a full nuclear power plant. That inspired me. We will follow up with you guys afterwards and see if you're convinced. Uh, so this is a, exactly the test audience that we would want for your pitch. Great job, Biba. Now, something interesting up here. We've heard from Alfred, who comes from a country of tens of kilowatt hours per year. Now, kilowatt hour, what is this? That's the amount of energy to run a hair dryer for one hour, a one kilowatt heater if you're from a cold country that uses electric heating. So you're telling me, Alfred, that your country now, not even back in the Civil War, is, is enough electricity per year for each person to run a, a hair dryer for 20 hours or so. Wow. And then a, at a few hundred kilowatt hours per year, it sounds like we have Nigeria and a little bit higher Egypt, and a little bit higher than that, I think, is South Africa. Maybe the order's not quite right. And then above that, Seth and Ia, you come from countries with many thousands of kilowatt hours per year. What, up to uh, eight or 9,000 household consumption in states around where you live, Seth. And then that's just household consumption. When we said 20 for you, Alfred, that's not just for your personal hair dryer, if you need to do that. It's for all the industries in the country, all the businesses in the country in total, yes? Sure, sure. So we're dealing with orders of magnitude, not just 10 times more, but hundreds of times more energy for Seth and Ia, and hundreds of times less for Alfred, and somewhere in the middle for you, Abu Bakr and Amanda. And uh, wow, uh, so I want to ask you, Alfred, what does it feel like when you hear people in other parts of the world turn off nuclear plants that are already constructed and working? How does, how does that feel to hear? Um, well, first of all, I feel like life is not fair because what we are struggling to have, other people are already taking it for granted. For example, when AI just mentioned that they closed about two or three nuclear power plants in equivalence of uh, about... Is it 3,000 megawatts? Which, of course, Sagarin is just about um, 150 megawatts installed capacity, about 8 million people. So you see the bigger gap. So it's painful, um, it's stressful. Well, I think moving forward, Sagarin can start appreciating the fact that we are still below the human development index. And one of the reasons for that is because of our energy poverty. So moving forward, we should invest more into energy because we can continue looking at other people to provide the solutions for us. But I think if we can build solutions from within, capacitating our youth, um, introducing courses in our universities that could provide the human capacity that will be needed to drive that energy need, I think um, it will be nice. But really, it is very unfair. Like, you're struggling to have something and then other people are already taking it for granted. 
you, Alfred. And if you could pass the microphone to Seth, I know you've worked on nuclear energy issues around the world. We've heard sitting on both sides of you dreams of nuclear, in some cases, uh, almost like a space race from a country that can barely keep the lights on for a small number of people. And on the other side, Abu Bakr has a nation with, you know, great oil resources and it's a land of decentralized, noisy, loud generators. What would you say in advising nations should, is there, an, is there too early to dream about nuclear? And if not, how should you prepare if you're at the different levels of development we hear today? It's not too early, and without overcoming energy poverty, we won't overcome poverty. We won't lift people up, they won't have better education, they won't have better health care. We need to address energy for human beings everywhere. And nuclear power is a very feasible way to do it, if not in a national program, then perhaps in a regional program with neighbors. There are large reactors that uh, are being deployed around the world, and there are new smaller, lower cost reactors in development that will be deployed. And part of what we're doing at Lightbridge is developing a fuel to make all of them more economical, to make the reactors provide more power, have longer fuel cycles, and help to bring nuclear power to the world, particularly through the small reactors that will fit the grids in lesser developed economies. Thank you, Seth. And uh, some really interesting stories here today. What I think we'll do is we'll start from Ia and come on back in the original order of introductions. I'd like to hear your final message for the attendees of COP27. I think my final message has to be that we have now heard these stories from wildly different countries and by the different people and we have to for those of us that have it we have to analyze our privilege we have to understand our privilege and we have to not take for granted what we have we have to protect the resources we have in the world especially for energy production because that is going to be the defining factor and if we can solve this climate crisis or not and we can't afford to lose what we have because this is one global system it's not just countries on their own. Everyone's actions are affecting everyone right now. So to everyone at COP27, cooperate. And to all the people on the negotiation table, negotiate better. You're not doing a very good job. Well, my last uh, message to COP27 attendees uh, is in two categories, generally and specifically. Generally to everyone, uh, We've come and met uh, people from different parts of the globe, and uh, we see how generations of energies uh, looks like and uh, what it takes to uh, meet the net zero uh, emission. So I believe we should take these uh, resolutions back to our uh, respective countries. Uh, some of us might not have the chance to meet uh, our politici politicians and leaders, but then there are different ways to pass messages. We should try as much as possible to pass these messages to them so as to uh, take the proper action with respect to uh, energy predicaments in our respective uh, countries. And then specifically to we, the, uh, the young guys in the nuclear industry, well, there's this thing I have been saying uh, ever since I come here, that uh, this is one of the rarest things that can happen in on any uh, energy source uh, industry. Uh, we've we have people from different parts of the globe, from Nigeria, from Sierra Leone, from Sweden, from France, from Egypt, from all across the globe, all fighting for a single cause. Because they, we understood that this could help the world uh, overcome uh, the, the, the climatic challenge we have. Which, so my message is we should keep it up. When, in no any circumstances we will uh, uh, like a stop or uh, slow down in what we are doing. We should keep it up until and unless uh, we achieve the mission. Thank you. Well, I would say to the negotiators here at COP27 that 
climate goals will only be met with a significant increase in nuclear power around the world as part of the diversified energy mix. And in the negotiations going on relating to climate justice, where there is a great difference between the countries that have been generating the carbon into our atmosphere and growing their economies, not wanting to make payments to countries with less developed economies that are already suffering such severe consequences of climate change, that nuclear power can be one of the ways to help bridge these positions. Financing made available to bring nuclear power to countries to not only provide carbon-free power, but lift up the lives of people and provide the power needed for other climate mitigation actions in the countries. Um, my last word to the decision makers and the attendees of the COP27 today is that, uh, particularly for African country, for the African continent, I'd say that uh, we need to really, really look into um, having baseload power in our system. And baseload power meaning that we're not just relying on only renewables that are being sold at a very high rate right now and look attractive but we're going to need something that is going to be stable for us to develop better and uh, so that we can achieve all these uh, UN SDGs, uh, talking about health, talking about education, as Seth had mentioned, that it, the powerhouse becomes the stable nuclear source. It becomes um, the baseload power that we have to have. So our decision makers, I would like them to actually include nuclear power in their energy taxonomy, make sure that the energy mix involves nuclear power because it's the most stable, whilst at the same time you are able to benefit socioeconomic, um, you have socioeconomic benefits and you are also meeting the climate change actions uh, achievements. So that's my last one. My last, my last one is the implementation. We usually make these policies uh, as governments, uh, especially the African continent. But the implementation of these things, we never see them. They leave government offices without having implemented anything. So right now, we need them to be actually be, count, be accountable for their policy, the policies that they've made, and implement them. And we see that we. I am proud of Egypt for ev having uh, this nuclear deal and having actually working on it and uh, having to have the nuclear power plant. South Africa has, a power has started activities in the nuclear industry since the 1950s, but we just haven't been moving at the right rates uh, to see more of these activities going forward. We've shut down most of our uh, front-end nuclear fuel cycle. We are left with the back-end fuel cycle. So now I would like them to actually look into um, c continuing the nuclear programs even better so that we can uh, achieve more stable power. And, and Unemployment in South Africa is about 40% unemployment in youth. So to also um, combat the unemployment in South Africa, we're going to need stable power. We're going to need uh, to have uh, sources of energy that uh, we can rely on, cheap and affordable at the same time. Thank you. Yes, I would also say my last words from the implementation perspective. I strongly believe that much has been said in the past COPs, COP26 and even this one. And uh, if... What has been said and the promises that have been made are not being implemented and actions are not taken, relevant actions are not taken, would come back to COP28 with the same issues and COP29 and so on and so forth. So I strongly believe that each and every one of us that have had the opportunity to witness COP27, we have a shared responsibility to go back to our homes and our countries with the message we've had here, the negotiations that have occurred here, and ensure we are part of the process of telling our government and the, 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 the responsible stakeholders that should take action, follow up with them and ensure that they take the relevant actions that are needed to, of course, mitigate climate change. And, of course, including nuclear could be one of those solutions we are talking about here. So, for example, myself, I know I have a responsibility back home moving from here because I have my local um, organizations I'm working with and so on and so forth. So each and every one of us should take this zeal back home to ensure that what has been said at COP27 is implemented before we come here back for COP28 or maybe in the UAE or somewhere else. Thank you. Um, my last message uh, in this panel, nuclear is not zombie. Nuclear is not ghost. It's not going to kill you. You should go with nuclear, not against it. Thank you so much for all of you uh, for attending. Please come catch up with our speakers after the event. And thank you all of you who have traveled so far to be here. And I think we will appreciate your messages as we head home.